Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome. Welcome, everybody. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tom Miles. I'm the Dean of the Law School. And thank you all for joining us for today's Fulton Lecture. The Maurice and Muriel Fulton Lecture in Legal History was created in 1985 through a gift from Maurice Fulton, who was a member of the law school class of 1942 and his wife Muriel, who is an alumna of the college. And we're delighted to welcome Barbara today uh, here to the law school, the Fulton family. And, and I, have to, I have to share this spectacular uh, photograph that, that Barbara has shared uh, of the Fultons uh, on the quadrangle. Um, I have to say, I think everybody was more fashionable then. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful piece of, of deep connection and history with the law school and the college. Um, and, and indeed, you know, fr the University of Chicago Law School has, from its very beginning, uh, celebrated and championed interdisciplinary legal education and interdisciplinary legal scholarship. From our very first year of operation, the law school encouraged students who were coming from the college to take courses in legal history because as our uh, uh, materials at that time described it, they were of special importance and value to any future lawyer. And in particular, it singled out courses that uh, students should take before coming to law school. The Constitutional and Political History of England a two-part course before and after the reign of Edward I, and the constitutional history of the United States, also a two-part course before and after 1815. And it's so wonderful that the Fulton Lecture continues this tradition of celebration of interdisciplinary legal scholarship and teaching, and in particular, legal history, by bringing a di distinguished legal historian to the law school to speak every year. And in recent years, the Fulton Lecture has covered topics in legal history ranging from the impact of propaganda on civil liberties in World War I, as well as the impact of Presidents Johnson and Nixon on the contemporary US Supreme Court. And I'm thrilled that today we add to this distinguished legacy. We are delighted to welcome to the law school, I should say welcome back to the law school, Professor Daniel Ernst as our 2022 Fulton Lecturer. Professor Ernst is the Carmack Waterhouse Professor of Legal History at Georgetown University Law Center. Professor Ernst is a distinguished scholar of legal history. His book, Lawyers Against Labor, From Individual Rights to Corporate Liberalism, won the Littleton Griswold Prize from the American Historical Association for the best book on any subject in the history of American law and society. Also, his article entitled The Politics of Administrative Law won the Sorency Prize for the best article in Law and History Review from the American Society for Legal History. He has many other important works, including the book De Tocqueville's Nightmare, The, Emergence, uh, the Administrative State Emerges in America, and he's been a recipient of a John Simon Guggenheim Fellowship. Professor Ernst holds a PhD in history uh, from Princeton, and as I mentioned, his greatest accomplishment is that he received his JD from the University of Chicago Law School. Indeed, as a student, he already showed his scholarly abilities in that he won the Casper Platt Prize for the most outstanding student paper. His current book in progress is entitled Lost Ships, Elite Lawyers and the New Deal, and today he will speak on Jerome Frank, The Making of a New Deal Lawyer. Please join me in welcoming back to the law school our 2022 Fulton Lecturer, Professor Daniel Ernst. Thank you, uh, Dean Miles, for inviting me to be this year's Fulton Lecturer, uh, and thank you for that introduction. And thanks especially uh, to Barbara uh, on behalf of her parents for uh, creating this lectureship, which I consider the premier endowed lectureship in my field. Uh, it's a great encouragement to legal historians everywhere that this, fellowship, this uh, lectureship exists. Uh, even if time permitted, my emotions would not if I tried to explain uh, why I'm so moved to be delivering, as I said, the premier endowed lecturer uh, in my field, 
at the place where 40 years ago, it turns out, uh, I began learning how to be a legal historian uh, with the help of some people uh, who are in uh, this room today. I was uh, Jeff Stone's research assistant, uh, and uh, Dick Helmholtz is here, and I owe him a great deal. Uh, instead uh, of trying to uh, say how much the lecture uh, means to me, I'll simply say that I hope that any students in the audience uh, today feel, as I did then, that one of the great things uh, about this law school is that the members of its first, uh, its world-class uh, faculty recognize and nurture the scholarly aspiration of their students. At 7 o'clock in the evening of February 5th, 1935, the Department of Agriculture uh, announced a reorganization of the Agricultural Adjustment Administration, or AAA. Uh, the agency created at the start of Franklin Roosevelt's presidency to implement the New Deal's farm policy. Officially, the move was taken to make the administration a more efficient operating unit. Journalists saw a purge of left-wingers. It was a bloodless purging, one explained, but ruthlessly executed, the elimination of the last stronghold of militant liberalism in the New Deal. The most eminent of the purge was AAA's general counsel, Jerome Frank, identified by the Washington Post as one of the best known uh, New Deal legal lights. Postmortems did not spare the principal victim. Uh, Felix Frankfurter, uh, in the center of this montage, published uh, in the Herald Tribune uh, in October of 1935, uh, had recommended Frank for the job uh, and blamed him not so much for Frank's apparent belief that law is bunk, as Frankfurter put it, but for Frank's gratuitous candor. Uh, not long after this montage appeared, uh, the Harvard law professor scolded Frank for failing to realize that public life is warfare, that it is always permeated by people who are, in Holmes's phrase, fired with a zeal to pervert, that the luxury of letting one's mind run through one's tongue is a luxury that can't be indulged in, and that there are lots of things that can be or and should be done, but shouldn't be talked about. As an example, Frankfurter might have cited the address that Frank delivered in December 1933 at the annual meeting of the Association of American Law Schools at what is now uh, the Hilton Chicago. In Experimental Jurisprudence and the New Deal, Frank asserted that many judges, confronted with a difficult factual situation, consciously or unconsciously, uh, tend to commence their thinking with what they consider to be a desirable decision, and then work backwards to appropriate premises devising syllogisms to justify that decision. To illustrate the point that the lawyers of the New Deal did the same thing, he told the story of two attorneys, each tasked with determining the legality of the same measure under a statute. The first attorney, Mr. Triot, began with the objective. This, he said, is a desirable result. It is all but essential uh, in the existing crisis. The administration is for it, and justifiably so. It is obviously in line with the general intention of Congress, as shown by the legislative history. The statute is ambiguous. Let us work out an argument, if possible, so to construe the statute to validate this important program. The second attorney, Mr. Absolute, resolved to be aloof and indifferent to the ill effects of an adverse conclusion. He read and reread the statute and ultimately produced an opinion that was interchangeable with Mr. Triad's. Neither opinion revealed any concern for social consequences, but subconsciously, they had influenced Mr. Absolute quite as much as they had Mr. Triad. Frank had AAA issue a press release uh, summarizing his speech, certainly after he delivered it, after it somehow became controversial, um, he had it published in full 
uh, in the congressional record. Frank and his legal division at AAA figure in a book I am writing uh, on elite lawyers who went to Washington at the end of Herbert Hoover's presidency and the uh, beginning of, of Franklin Roosevelt. Able and ambitious, they were sure of their professional ability, but unfamiliar with what Frankfurter called Washington's reefs and shoals. That is, the politics within federal administrative agencies, within the executive branch, and between the executive branch and Congress. Even if they had had prior experience in government, that might have failed them, because they arrived in the Capitol in the midst of an unprecedented economic collapse and a vast expansion of the federal government that vested enormous discretionary power in administrators, many of whom were also newcomers uh, to public office. Uh, perhaps not surprisingly, uh, some of the most prominent of the first lawyers ran aground on those reefs and shoals, or if they stayed afloat, did so by swiping, uh, swapping their professional identity for a political one. Uh, thus, the title of my book is Lost Ships, after the only uh, keepsake that uh, one of my protagonists, uh, Tom Corcoran, requested, he was a Holmes clerk, uh, was present when Oliver Wendell Holmes died. And the only uh, keepsake that he asked for was a framed needlepoint of a Greek epigram step stitched by Holmes's wife. A shipwrecked sailor buried on this coast bids thee take sail. Full many a gallant ship when we were lost weathered the gale. As a group, New Deal lawyers did weather the gale and learned, even from the shipwrecks, how to develop the administrative procedures and practices that have made government lawyers guardrails against illiberal and authoritarian governance. As perhaps some of you may already be thinking, uh, one of uh, uh, the people who weathered the gale him, was Frank himself. He was one of the survivors. After a brief period out of government, he came back as a member of the Securities and Exchange Commission in 1937, then chaired it uh, from 1939 until his appointment to the Second Circuit in 1941. Frank's fall and subsequent rise would take more time uh, to tell than I have today. So instead, I'm going to narrate how Frank became Mr. Triot and went to Washington. Some of that story will be familiar to anyone who knows him as a legal realist, or as he appears in Peter Irons' New Deal Lawyers, as a legal reformer. Some of that story suggests why Frank resists any categorization, his unique combination of intellect and personality that his friend William O. Douglas tried to capture uh, when he said that Frank had the sharpest, quickest, most incisive mind and also was one of the most lovable and endearing characters he had ever known. But Frank's early life and career also brings out an easily overlooked fact that Frank was a first-rate corporate lawyer and that as such he brought to the New Deal capacities required for the effective regulation of corporate America. So Jerome knew Frank was born in a brownstone in 330 East 16th Street in New York City on September 10th, uh, 1889, the descendant of Bar Bavarian Jews who had immigrated about 40 years earlier. His father, a lawyer, moved the family to Chicago's south side in 1897, about 20 blocks north of here, uh, when Frank was still in grade school. He grew up well-to-do, but not wealthy, in an enclave of German Jews, many of whom uh, attended the stately Sinai Temple, the home of one of the nation's leading reform congregations. Precocious, with a, uh, what a classmate called a mania for arguing, Frank entered the University of Chicago at age 16. He studied political economy with Robert Hoxie and the class struggle in society with Albion Small, the sociologist. Uh, but the teacher who most influenced him was Charles Merriam, the 
then in the process of reorienting political science from the parsing of Germanic abstractions to the empirical investigation of political institutions and behavior. Frank so impressed Merriam that when the professor, a hero of Chicago's progressives, ran for alderman and won in 1909, he hired Frank as his secretary, even though the young man had just started his studies at this law school. Uh, Merriam recalls Frank as always enthusiastic, impetuous, passionate in his hatred of wrong and injustice, keen and subtle in his intellectual processes. But after a year of battling the likes of Hinky Dink Kenna and bathhouse John Coughlin, uh, and a, an ultimatum from his fiancée, uh, Florence Kuyper, Frank returned to the law school uh, in the fall of 1910. In those days, the core of Chicago's law faculty still consisted of acolytes of the founding dean, Joseph Beale, a Harvard law professor loaned to Chicago on the understanding that it would adopt, quote, the spirit and methods of the Harvard Law School. Beale's boys faithfully employed the case method of Christopher Columbus Langdell to impart a notion of law as rules discovered through an a priori process of induction from the holdings of uh, appellate cases. Skill in the analysis of upper court opinions and the elaboration of exquisitely made legal doctrines were the very essence of the pedagogy, Frank recalled. At least at first, he found the instruction captivating. The untidy disciplines of economics, politics, and history uh, a bank uh, uh, of his undergraduate studies paled by comparison. How could a theory of money or a history of banking seem important when you were learning about the equity of redemption uh, or the rule about fictitious payees, uh, he later wrote. Frank had a few courses from more heterodox legal scholars, including the legal realist Walter Wheeler Cook and the German-educated Ernst Freund. But the professor who most influenced him was Julian Mack, a German Jew born in San Francisco, raised in Cincinnati, and uh, graduated with honors from the Harvard Law School. Mack moved to the South Side in 1890 and had taught as an adjunct at this law school since its founding in 1902. Frank would have known Mack as well, at least by reputation, as the organizer of a lecture series jointly sponsored by the Sinai Temple and the University of Chicago, as the president of uh, the Julius Rosenwald-funded literary society, the Book and Play Club, uh, and as the judge of Chicago's pioneering and nationally renowned juvenile court. Mack taught nothing like the Beelists. There were no eight rules with 14 exceptions, Frank recalled. Instead, Mack told us of how problems were flung in the raw at lawyers by their clients or at judges by lawyers. He gave students a taste of the unlogical, shifting, untidy, uncertain, thoroughly human, catch-as-catch-can thing we are, we're going to be grappling with in the practice of law. You never knew precisely where you were in Mack's class, but the fragmentariness of it all was immensely stimulating. Evidently, Mack found Frank stimulating, too. He asked, asked the young man to be his law clerk when Mack was named to a short-lived Article III court that heard uh, appeals from the Interstate Commerce Commission and proved to be the first step in uh, Mack's uh, federal judicial career uh, that ended with him presiding over complex litigation in the Southern District of New York. Uh, Frank, I should show you Frank, there he is. Uh, uh, from cap and gown in 1912. Uh, Frank graduated from law school in August 1912 with the highest grade point uh, average on record. In October, he started as an associate at Levinson, Becker, Cleveland, and Schwartz, a so-called mixed firm with both Jewish and Gentile partners and a very substantial corporate practice. His seniors recognized his legal brilliance and made him a partner four years later. Benjamin Becker credited him with the firm's victory over a clutch of New York firms 
in, enormous, uh, in an enormous corporate reorganization. Another Chicago lawyer marveled at Frank's ability to master the most difficult and complex business situations and to overcome what was seemingly insurmountable obstacles to an adjustment of litigation. A most intense worker, he received in 1927 a fifth of the firm's profits. But corporate law could not contain Frank's restless intellect. Rarely did he arrive at work without a book under his arm. His literary interests covered a wide range, Becker recalled, including the classics, philosophy, fiction, and mystery. Uh, from 1920 to 1922, Frank presided over the Book and Play Club. Most Saturdays, he could be found in a downtown saloon for informal gatherings of the city's most venturesome professionals with such, with such literati as John Gunther, Ben Hecht, Carl Sandburg, and Sherwood Anderson. Frank and his wife Florence, a poet and playwright uh, who, as a friend put it, never quite arrived, were principals in theater companies and entertained Edgar Lee Masters, Upton Sinclair, and other literary lions. Their uh, Winnetka home, a neighbor recalled, was a center of liberal thought and stimulating conversation on national and international uh, affairs, literature, and culture generally. He was, by all accounts, an extraordinary uh, conversationalist. A junior at Levinson and Becker recalled that he could hold forth on almost any subject, uh, the latest novel or drama, the comparative methods of competing schools of psychology, or recent advances in astrophysics. He spouts theories by the minute, a journalist claimed during the New Deal. In the space of a half an hour, I have heard him develop successively a cloacal theory of the rise and fall of nations, a scent gland theory of love, a loneliness theory of small town life in America, and a community song fest theory of the National Recovery Administration. <laughs> he spoke too eagerly to be pompous, William Douglas explained, and swept up others in his wit and ebullience. A Winnetka neighbor thought her friends always appeared more brilliant when they were with him. North Shore housewives uh, and hostesses vied to have him at dinner, as a dinner guest, even though they knew he would arrive late, if at all. <laughs> he delighted in launching conversations with outlandish observations. During their first uh, social uh, evening together, Ulysses S. Schwartz, uh, a close friend, recalled that Frank denied the existence of absolute standards um, of conduct. To make his point, he placed his hat upside down on his head and declared that but for social convention, he might as well wear it as any other way. He, had Flor uh, he and Florence were early proponents of birth control. They had one daughter. Um, and the first in their social set to discuss Freud. They were quite too startling for almost any of us, Schwartz acknowledged. But Jerome's impersonal way of presenting any, on, uh, any kind of subject took the curse off it. For a corporate lawyer, he was unusually engaged in public affairs. During a strike of clothing workers in the fall of 1915, Frank and his friend Schwartz, uh, acting on behalf of a leading Jewish charity, investigated whether clothing manufacturers counted on private philanthropy to supplement their workers' low wages. Because he was married and a father, Frank uh, was not likely to be drafted during World War I. Instead, he volunteered to assist um, uh, the chief of, of the meat division of the War Food Administration, uh, the masterful uh, uh, New York corporate lawyer, Joseph Cotton, whom Frank had impressed in a railroad reorganization. Frank's job was to create a record of the negotiations in which Co Cotton practically set the prices that the great meat pro uh, packing companies charged a purchasing commission uh, uh, for the Allied forces. The cause uh, that most engaged Frank, however, 
was a crusade against the corrupting influence of streetcar franchises in city government. His first skirmish came before the war when he helped his friend Schwartz, a newly, uh, newly elected as an alderman, oppose the grant of a franchise on much too favorable terms. After the war, Schwartz uh, proposed a scheme that while leaving the operation of streetcars in private hands, would have the city acquire the lines and create a public board to oversee them. And ingenious securitization of projected revenues, Frank's brainchild, would finance the purchase. To build support, Schwartz became uh, chairman of the city council's local transportation committee and hired Frank as one of its lawyers. Then, in 1923, the good government candidate William Deaver became mayor and invited Frank into his kitchen cabinet. Only Frank fully understood the securitization proposal, Schwartz confessed. Jerome would explain one detail after another, holding the attention of all, like a young Hamilton in Washington's cabinet. Once, when everyone's nerves were strayed to pretty nearly the exploding point, Frank recited some uh, dashed-off doggerel that broke the tension. But even a, a witty Hamilton could not prevail over the massed opposition of utility magnates, William Randolph Hearst newspapers, socialists set on stronger measures, and party bosses intent on dealing Deaver a blow. The proposal was defeated in a referendum in the spring of 1925, and Deaver lost a re-election bid two years later. The defeat of the traction ordinance dealt Frank a blow, too. The ordinance had figured in what he later termed his ambition fantasies. Its defeat left him face to face with the prospect that he might end his days as a corporate lawyer a career he claimed that his father had bullied him into. The protagonist of an unfinished novel, Frank wrote at this time, probably voiced Frank's own rue and regret in declaring himself a well-paid servant of this pitiful creature, the businessman, a player of an amusing if somewhat shoddy game by which he could am e most easily amass a competence. Frank later described himself as restless, wanting to do everything except what I was doing. He was constantly rebelling against being a lawyer, doing it competently, but still interiorly objecting to it, his energy absorbed by frictions of various sorts. Not long after the defeat of the traction plan, Frank agreed to handle a matter for the firm requiring an extended stay in New York City. While there, he happened upon the psychiatrist uh, Bernard Gluick, the principal expert in Clarence Darrow's defense of the famous thrill killers, uh, Nathan uh, Leopold and Richard Loeb. Uh, if you want to know uh, Frank's connection uh, with uh, that, uh, the thrill killers, you'll have to ask me uh, after the lecture. Uh, after Frank disclosed his inner turmoil to the psychiatrist, Gluick proposed a year's psychoanalysis. Frank countered that he would only be in town for six months and somehow persuaded Gluick to see him twice daily uh, at 8.30 in the morning and then again at 6 o'clock in the evening. Frank claimed that psychoanalysis did him a great deal of good, uh, but that was not always apparent to others. Uh, a young lawyer at Levinson and Becker recalled that Jerry had great feelings of insecurity. He would worry legal questions to death. For no apparent reason, he would write long memoranda for the files defending his decisions, covering himself for each step in any difficult case or set of negotiations. One phase of Frank's life was, un uh, other phases of Frank's life was unsettled as well. In 1927, the child psychologist who had been treating his, uh, uh, Frank's daughter for the psychos uh, psychosomatic par paralysis of her legs moved to New York so that her treatment might continue. That summer, 
Frank rented a house for her in uh, Florence in Crowton on Hudson, an hour's commute uh, from Manhattan. In June 1928, he sold his Winnetka house. A year later, he joined his family in New York. Uh, after considering several offers on Judge Mack's advice, he landed, uh, he decided on Chad Board Levy in Staunchfield, one of the few top corporate law firms in New York uh, with both Jewish and Gentile partners. His partnership at Levinson Becker formally ended on the last day of 1929. Sometime before then, he started working on Chad Board matters. He formally uh, joined the firm after his admission to the New York uh, bar in early 1930. As in Chicago, uh, Frank looked for some public service to supplement his day job. In April 1930, through uh, an ally in the Chicago Street Railway fight, he offered his services to Governor Franklin Roosevelt. When Roosevelt checked with Felix Frankfurter, the Harvard Law professor passed along Mack's praise of Frank's keen intellectual powers, but could not say whether Frank was right for the kinds of things you have in mind. Frank also pursued his longstanding literary ambitions, enriched by his recent exposure to Freudian psychology. One short story had a guilt-ridden, fire and brimstone preacher lose his sway over his congregation after re releasing his previously sublimated sexual energy in an orgiastic revel. Similarly, Frank's partially completed novel had its lawyer protagonist cured of anxiety over his professional life after a passionate affair. But after an editor at Houghton Mifflin found the manuscript, well, not without interest, too explicit to be published in Boston, <laughs> Frank turned to no a nonfiction project that became his most widely read work. The book's origins run back to the unexpected death in March 1928 of James Parker Hall, dean of the University of Chicago Law School uh, since Beale's return to Harvard. Ostensibly writing for his circle of law alumni, Frank recommended that Hall's successor commit the school to the preparation of lawyers for the bewildering uncertainties of law practice. The Bealists, he said, gave students the impression that law was a definite and complete body of doctrine existing apart from the facts to which it was applied. This ill prepared them for the discovery that law and facts were inextricably joined, that, say, the law of corporations was no abstraction, but very human, full of problems of manufacturing, stock market operations, labor questions, men's cupidities, and men's dreams. Even an honor student, Frank wrote, would go down in the struggle if he could not find a way to reconcile the abstractions he had been taught with the concreteness of daily life. In 1928, Frank did not jump all the way to Freud. He stopped with Holmes's maxim that the life of the law had not been logic but experience. Before long, however, he found another lesson in Holmes's writing, that uncertainty in the law was less a problem to be solved than a condition to be accepted. In Law and the Modern Mind, published in October 1930 with an introduction from Judge Mack, uh, Frank argued that the desire for certainty in the law was an adult's version of a childish need for an authoritative uh, father figure. The widespread notion that law either is or can be made approximately stationary and certain personified uh, the father as infallible judge and was a delusion. Mature thinkers like Holmes freed themselves of this carryover of the childish dread of and respect for uh, paternal uh, omnipotence. They accepted that law continuously adapted itself to the realities of contemporary social industrial and political conditions, that it was an ongoing social process aiming to satisfy as much as is possible of the whole body of human wants. 
Only legal formulations that were socially functional should be treated as fixed and settled, and then only as long as they continued to work. Well, much as the printed word could, law in the modern mind captured Frank's wit and brilliance as a conversationalist, his wide reading in philosophy, psychology, anthropology, and his literature, his knack for sprightly uh, conveying the gist of often ponderous academic writings, and his audacity in, uh, displayed in calling out eminent jurists who still indulged in the debilitating irresponsibility of relying upon supposed safety-conferring external authority. His charge that Roscoe Pound was doing his best to, quote, make the law safe for Bealism, uh, outraged the Harvard law professor, but delighted younger uh, law professors, including Columbia's and, yes, later, University of Chicago's uh, Carl Llewellyn, who had recently faulted Pound for squandering his vast learning on bedtime stories for the tired bar. Frankfurter called the book the most refreshing and self-examining uh, self piece of writing on the law that has come my way for many a year, and entered into a lengthy correspondence with its author. Sometimes the, the correspondence turned prickly, as when Frankfurter instructed Frank, agitated by word that Pound had accused Frank, I'm sorry, that uh, uh, Frank had accused Pound of misquoting him, not to drag others into the fray. Uh, Frankfurter uh, wrote, at a time when we all need the intellectual resources, all the intellectual resources that make, we can muster, and all the stimulus that comes from camaraderie among fellows in the same craft, polemics in ill will are luxuries we cannot afford. Still, Frankfurter enjoyed the exchanges. What a pleasure it is to start any kind of discussion with you, he wrote. I like the way you keep the ball going and only wish that time and distance were not barriers to the game. Uh, Frank uh, relished the entree to the legal uh, uh, academy that law and modern mind provided, and he pursued it avidly. I'm delighted you are quarreling with me, he wrote to Harvard's Thomas Reed Powell. I want to be educated, so shoot away, O oh Socrates. <laughs> he helped uh, Llewellyn uh, reply to Pound's 1931 article on legal realism and complained to Judge Mack when the president of the Harvard Law Review, uh, Paul Freund, initially refused Llewellyn's space. Yale's legal realists were still more congenial, irreverent iconoclasts, unconstrained in their scholarship and consumption of alcohol, Thurman Arnold, uh, William Douglas, uh, Walton Hamilton, and Wesley Sturgis recognized a kindred sp uh, spirit and finagled an appointment for Frank as associate, a research associate in law for the 1932-33 academic year. Formally, the ob appointment obligated Frank only to attend a few faculty lunches and meet with a few students. It was also understood that he would transport bootleg liquor to New Haven. <laughs> Still, Frank formed lasting friendships with Arnold, whom he hailed as the New Haven Montaigne, uh, and Douglas, with whom he co-authored articles calling for the reform of corporate reorganizations. Uh, through uh, 1931, Frank worked on another book calling for improve, improving the fact-finding capacity of American uh, trial courts. He organized lectures on the law at the New School for Social Research, and he spoke on radio broadcasts with the philosopher Morris Cohn, with um, Harold Lasky, and with Judge Mack. He had uh, considered abandoning law practice for the legal academy as early as April 1928, when he half seriously proposed himself to Laird Bell as James Parker Hall's successor. After the publication of Law in the Modern Mind, Leon Green, Northwestern's law dean, 
sounded Frank out on joining his faculty. At first, Frank put him off, but Green persisted and tried to raise funds for his salary. Frank's friends at Yale did the same, but had to settle for his reappointment as research uh, associate. Meanwhile, Frank's practice uh, proved unsatisfying. To be sure, the firm's principal partner impressed him. Six foot, six inches tall, with a bass voice, deep bass voice, Thomas Chadburn was, a journalist reported, a giant of a man, mentally as well as physically, and held his own even among the outside egos of the Wall Street bar. But with 38 lawyers and retainers from 150 corporations, the firm was much larger than Levinson Becker and top-heavy with mediocre partners brought to handle long-forgotten uh, matters. Also, the work could be crushing. A complicated bank merger, one of those every night and Sunday jobs, consumed him during the winter of 1931 and 32. In the fall of 1932, the receivership of the Interboro uh, Rapid Transit subway uh, again had him working days, nights, and weekends until revelations that a Chadmore, Chadburn partner had, in effect, bribed a federal judge to have the firm appointed receiver forced Frank to drop uh, the case. I am so fed up with the tawdry aspects of practice that I would like nothing better than a permanent job along so, uh, alongside you, and appalled Frank uh, wrote to Thurman Arnold. Uh, Frank also took his problems uh, to Felix Frankfurter, <clears throat> who soon uh, thereafter uh, wrote Frank, I was deep, very deeply moved <clears throat> by your visit, greatly touched that you should have felt like talking with me when a personal problem confronted you. After Roosevelt's election in November 1932, Frank asked the law professor to help him find a job in Albany or Washington. Of course the country, state or nation, needs you badly in its service, Frankfurter replied. Where, when, and how is a matter of taking advantage of circumstances. Over the next months, Frank reminded Frankfurter of his interests and usefulness. In December of 1932, he asked the law professor what he thought of Adolph Burl Burley's and uh, Gardner Means' just published The Modern Corporation and Private Property. Uh, Frank ventured that it identified what may well be the vital problem of our times, the separation of ownership from the control of the large business corporation. Frank also told Frankfurter of his proposal to create a receivership division in the Department of Justice to police corporate bankruptcies, uh, administrative uh, review of corporate reorganizations would resurface in the Chandler Act of 1938 drafted uh, while uh, Frank was a member of the Securities and Exchange Commission and Douglas, uh, its chairman. Impressed, Frankfurter enlisted Frank in a campaign against a bill that insufficiently protected minority interests in railroad reorganizations. What a quick, imaginative, and energetic worker you are, Frankfurter exclaimed after receiving multiple missives on the matter from Frank. On March 15th, Less than a fortnight into Roosevelt's presidency, Frankfurter could finally hint that a job had turned up. If you get any kind of a bid from Washington, however funny it might look on the face of things, as being unrelated to your immediate legal experience, uh, Frankfurter wrote, don't make a wry face at it uh, until you've had a chance to talk with me about it. If what I think should by any chance come home, I really think it would be a swell opportunity for you. The next day, Frank uh, was cl closeted with um, investment bankers when he was called to the phone. Uh, the caller identified himself as Rexford Tugwell, the Assistant Secret uh, Secretary of Agriculture, who reported that Frankfurter had recommended him to be the USA's, USDA's top lawyer and asked him to come to Washington to meet uh, Henry A. Wallace. Uh, the Secretary of Agriculture. Florence thought her husband slightly insane even to consider a job that paid perhaps a, a fifth of his draw from the Chadbourne firm. Uh, even so, Frank boarded a train to Washington that night. 
Well, what, I ha what happened next is a long story, but I hope the story I I've told you is enough to suggest that we don't fully account for Jerome Frank's contribution to American legal history if we forget that he was a first-rate corporate lawyer with, as a former partner put it, an unusually broad experience in corporate reorganizations and corporate and financial problems. That a sudden expansion of the administrative state into American industry and finance required the expertise of corporate lawyers is, uh, shouldn't be surprising to anyone familiar with the legal history of the 20th century's two world wars. In the first, Herbert Hoover, as director of the War uh, Food Administration, knew he needed Joseph Cotton, who had left the Cravath firm but had not yet founded the firm now known as Cahill, Gordon, and Rindell, uh, to stand up to the Meatpackers and their immensely formidable lawyer, uh, Silas Strawn. Uh, as Ajay Morotra, who I'm very pleased to say is uh, here today, uh, uh, has shown uh, Russell Leffingwell uh, left the Cravath firm, and Arthur Ballantyne, his corporate practice in Boston uh, for the Treasury Department uh, in World War I. In the Second World War, John J. McCloy left Cravath to be Assistant Secretary of the War. Uh, of war. Uh, Lloyd Cuth Cutler also left Cravath for Len Lease. And when James Forrestal left the investment bank Dillon Reed to become undersecretary of the Navy, he took Struve Hensel, his lawyer at Millbank Tweed, with him. Well, the Great um, uh, Depression was, of course, only an analog of war. But the corporate lawyer's contribution to state capacity was just as vital. Frankfurter said as much when he pitched Jerome Frank to Rex Tugwell. Frank had two sides, Frankfurter explained. The playful, dialectic, argumentative side, which is very much the minor part of him, and the penetrating, practical experience, talent for bringing results to pass in the world of affairs. Well, if you think of Jerome Frank at all, odds are you think of that first side. And that, in fact, contributed to his ouster from AAA. But you should also remember his second side, because his opponents would never have bothered to mask the forces required to oust him had he not been so formidable. Thank you. was so uh, unsatisfied with being a corporate lawyer, but then spent so much of his intellectual energy on corporate topics. I mean, as soon as he got a chance, he was writing with, with Douglas and others, so writing about business and reorganization and so forth. So it wasn't that he didn't like the subject. So was it something about, I mean. He didn't like his clients. Okay. <laughs> uh, and what he understood uh, I, I have not been able to um, completely unravel the details of the scandal that uh, led to the dropping of the IRT case. But um, uh, uh, he and uh, one of his juniors at, at uh, Chadburn, uh, 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 Lee Pressman, who ends up playing an important role at AAA, uh, would exchange correspondence where they were just disgusted by things that had happened on the business side. So, um, uh, you know, he had this enormous skill and, and talent. It's a, a human capital you don't walk away from. And, you know, he's paired up with a former Cravath uh, lawyer, William Douglas, uh, to now play ho holy hell uh, with uh, the firms. Uh, there's a, a moment where uh, Abe Fortas is briefly on, back on the Yale Law faculty and uh, invites uh, Swain uh, up. Uh, and uh, Swain said afterwards, y you 
you basically hold me up down, upside down. And um, Swain is a great corporate reorganizer and shook the uh, fillings out of my teeth. So I think that was it. I think it was his problem with the practice of law. Yes? I'm curious if you could comment on what always strikes me as a kind of schizophrenic aspect of Frank um, between, the, between the theory and the practice. So you, you mentioned the psychoanalytic, the Freudian part of, of law in the modern mind. But of course, the other part of that was his view that the personality of the judge determines what the judge does. right? And you know the, <clears throat> excuse me, our judge's human paper in 1931, he's very explicit. He says, the personality of the judge plus the facts equals the judicial decision. Right? And this was considered a radical view even among the other, other legal realists. Yet it seems quite out of sync with what he did in practice. That is, I take it he didn't think that the personality of the judge was the determining factor about all the cases that he was handling were going to be resolved, or do you think he really did think that? Well, he's not a litigator. He's a deal lawyer. And so the law that he's thinking about is um, uh, what he imagines a, a judge will do. And uh, as long as he, you know, to use a phrase the legal historian Bob Gordon used, uh, felt that he could discern the, you know, uh, imminent rationality of society. As, he, as long as he could figure out which way he thought social, what social function required, he felt he could project that onto the judge. And maybe there'd be some variance for personality, but whatever he imagined social function the society needed would govern. So I don't actually know if it's the error term of the personality which made him so um, anxious about predicting. Um, I really think that the Freudianism was him uh, talking to himself. Uh, he did have a father who bossed him around, uh, and he probably felt that his maturing uh, had to deal uh, with getting beyond that uncertainty. But I... I, 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 I so that's the best I can do. He, um, uh, I think he, you know, instead of his Freudianism was, so I just said there's enough that there's some sex in there, but it's also like the underlying uh, 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 notion of social function would uh, guide Mr. Absolute or a judge to the solution, even if the judge was not aware of it. Yeah, I know. Yes, Jeff. Um, what would you say is Frank's greatest achievement apart from graduating from his law school? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't know his judicial career, so I might be selling something short there. Um, probably, and I say this, I'm stopping with him uh, after he gets uh, uh, ousted in 35. So I have done a little work on this, but not a lot. Uh, probably the implementation of the Public Utility Holding Company Act, because um, uh, he's chair for that. It wasn't his drafting; it was drafted by somebody else. Um, to you know, I, I don't know how much to credit him and how much to credit Douglas with the Chandler Act, but taking this, you know, corporate reorganization, the you know the the, the uh, biggest financial practice you could have as a lawyer. Uh, uh, and wresting it away from the bar, as, it, as he kind of did, and giving it to the SEC. His participation in that is important, but I think you have to give Douglas uh, the lead on that, since he had done all these studies. So that's the best I could say. Yes? How many copies of Law in the Modern Mind were sold, and how many editions were there? <laughs> I have to tell you, the first time I presented here, my very first outing, um, Dick, I was talking about um, labor uh, and uh, a, a strike that happened in the full-fashioned hosiery business. Uh, and Dick asked me what full-fashioned hosiery was. <laughs> Fortunately, my grandfather was a lawyer for a full-fashioned hosiery company. <laughs> but ever since, whenever I present, I have lived in terror of questions from Dick Helmholtz. So there's a chapter where I'm talking about um, uh, marketing agreements in the tobacco industry, and I have to figure out what burly t tobacco is 
because Dick Helmholtz is going to ask Dick, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> well, that gives you something to work on. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You mentioned state capacity. Uh, I wonder whether you can speculate about how Jerome Frank and maybe other New Deal lawyers would have dealt with the financial crisis of 2008, where one can say there was a, a lack of state capacity. Yeah, um, I could, but not well. Um, um, well, um, you know, this sort of gets to um, one's justification of one's day's job of producing lawyers and whether you feel good about that or not. Uh, I actually see a lot that happens in my period um, as building out the framework uh, of administrative law that gives, I'm um, focusing mostly within the government rather than in the private sector, but give lawyers leverage over administrators or their clients, uh, things like requirements of finding and fact and what have you. And so I think one of the stories might be, uh, this is a, actually a paper I've never published but is available, is how the, uh, the uh, corporate bar learns to love um, the SEC uh, in part because there's a similar shared professional experience. And so um, the role of gatekeeper within the financial industry uh, was really kind of important. But by the time we get to the downturn, uh, many of those lawyers in the firms are screened by the general counsel, and they're only seeing parts of what's going on. So this is um, me attempting to engage uh, uh, an event I've never studied. But I think he would strengthen the hands of lawyers as a source of, of uh, competence. So I can't say that that was the cause of the downturn, but to the extent that um, uh, uh, corporate, securities, uh, corporate lawyers might have done more but were screened, that would have been the problem. Yes? Uh, it strikes me that nowadays, when Biden is making appointments to the FTC or other administrative agencies, there's a lot of pushback if he tries to um, appoint a corporate lawyer as opposed to someone from a progressive organization. So I wonder, did you see the same thing in the New Deal? Was there pushback at FDR for appointing these corporate lawyers? And you know, do you think that uh, that pushback is misplaced because you know Jerome Frank uh, uh, brought a great deal of his work in corporate uh, America to the uh, New Deal? Yeah. Um... So I was trying to figure out whether, last night, when I found out that there was this transaction, of course, in your first year, whether I was basically unwittingly creating a kind of historical uh, justification for the course. <laughs> uh, that actually, oh, George Wright was a corporate lawyer, and he was... A I'm a 3L, so I haven't taken that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so um, I guess it depends on the, the lawyer. Um, and uh, one of the differences I have to say about the New Deal rather than war is that in the war, partners go to Washington. Uh, and not to Jerome Frank is very unusual uh, uh, to become a partner. In fact, uh, senators moved, uh, spoke amongst themselves speculating why a guy would walk away from $50,000 to take a $10,000 job. And they assumed that uh, Frank and Chad Bourne were in on some uh, uh, scheme to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, establish a cartel in the sugar industry. That's the only, only way they could figure that out. So, um, you know, if the uh, lawyers, uh, so there would be associates who would come in, and they were uh, uh, kind of resentful of the corporate practice like them. Uh, often they were. Uh, Ethnic, so they, they were Jewish or Catholic like corporate, and uh, were unlikely to make partner. So there were corporate lawyers who had kind of um, both a knowledge base, kind of an animus uh, uh, for capitalism. Uh, the people who were problematic were folks who were lawyers to, uh, say, trade associations that then went to the National Recovery Administration, something like that. So it kind of depends. Yes? To what extent, if any, did anti-Semitism play a role in his career? We know there was a lot of it, certainly in corporate law, 
on your telling he had a kind of charmed life. Do you have a sense of what, if any, role anti Semitism He played? is um, hard to figure out on this. I mean, you know, it's a vibrant reform community down there. Uh, you know, it's like Lake, it's, it's about 20 blocks north of the New York before the Edward moved down to the Night Cup. Late 19th century, early 20th century, you know, this is where the reformed Jews lived, and it was a, a big vibrant uh, community. And so he grew up in that, but he reacted against it kind of strongly. He thought that even reformed Judaism, we called it, he called it, um, Old wine that's put in mild bottles when it should have been just thrown away. Uh, so he actually um, had an unpublished work with his wife uh, critiquing Julius Rosenwald uh, on um, his uh, religious uh, beliefs. He was reformed Judaism. When um, he uh, was, um, I used to think that the problem happened when he went to AAA, uh, an agricultural, you know sat with agriculturalists. And one of the reasons that was given for why he couldn't be solicitor of the department, that we turned out he then became general counsel of AAA, was um, about his personality, which of course is always code. And so I thought that his, um, uh, he at one point instructed uh, Frank Shea, uh, his associate general counsels to stop hiring so many Jews. Uh, Frank Shea, labor partner, Shane Gardner, uh, Harvard. One folks in the circle wouldn't listen to him on that. Um, but um, I thought that was just kind of a, a problem that he had uh, because he was in government and this was a political constraint he was under. But it actually antedates that. Uh, so when uh, he proposed with Pressman a reorganization of the Chadbourne firm, uh, what partners to get rid of, what to keep, um, he did keep count of how many Jews he was keeping among the staff. And then uh, when he proposed these uh, lectures at the New School of Social Research, he made sure that they were not all just Jewish students. So, and yet he worked very closely with, um, you know, the people from the uh, you know, Russian and Polish Jewish immigration at the turn of the 20th century, plenty on his staff. And the joke, uh, when he hired, um, Ida Klaus, a uh, 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 Columbia law graduate, one of the few female lawyers there, that he would now have to hire a couple of dumb Gentiles. So, so um, he was playing around with it uh, uh, in, in various ways that I cannot give. If I, if I had the bottom line, then I would be able to build it into the talk. But I still don't quite know what to make of it. One more. Yeah. So you said that he had a connection to Thurman Arnold. Uh, he called him Montaigne. So um, in his own work on modern mind, that's the only really popular thing that he wrote. And even there, it wasn't as popular as, certainly not as popular as Thurman Arnold's works. And I was wondering what, uh, what, if any, reactions he had to the popularizing of uh, basically the law of capitalism, the folklore of capitalism, and that kind of stuff. How, what, how he thought about that. So, so just tell me that just a little bit more. So you mean, um, so um, how did he react to Thurman Arnold's essentially going popular press with? Uh, bottlenecks of business, and, yeah, and because it that. seems you know, he, antithetical to the other kinds of writing he did. You know, he tried, actually. So he had a book called If Men Were Angels, which was a defense of the administrative state prompted by Roscoe Pound's critique at the end of the 30s. Uh, and then he had America Must Choose, where he kind of came out with, uh, uh, you can call it a liberal version of American First. So he kept trying, the court's on trial. Um, but I think the problem with him, there was a story a clerk said that when a clerk thought that in one of his opinions it was a little turgid and that uh, here, this passage here would, might work better, uh, Frank would say, oh, this is very good. Here, we'll put it on at the end. And then he kept it. And so the writing is just this, just this accumulation of, of writing. And it comes across as very undisciplined. 
and was never had, um, you know, at least uh, Arnold's sense of how to make it a, an effective uh, 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 communication with the public. So I don't think it was um, a reaction against what Ireland was doing. It just, he, at the end of the day, he was not the kind of systematic thinker who would be that disciplined. Well, thank you very much for a terrific 2022 Fulton Lecture. A terrific to welcome you back to law school. And thank you to the Fulton family for joining us today and for making this a really special Fulton Lecture. Thank you very much.